Take, take the roll. Andrade. Here. Connor. Here. Wheeler. Here. DeLuca. Demmer. Hammond. McCombie. Ortiz. Here. Pappas. Here. Rita. Skillicorn. Here. Stava Murray. Stevens. Here. Turner. Hurley. Eight members present. We also uh, have Senator Don Harmon. We have Representative Kelly Burke also too. And uh, I do want to welcome our newest member, uh, Representative Stevens. Hopefully that uh, if the state was run like your city, I think we, we would be very, very efficient. So uh, I'm very honored to have you on our committee. And as a colleague, welcome to the state of Illinois and to our our General Assembly and, and uh, Cybersecurity Data Analytics Committee. Okay, we're gonna start with Lori Sorensen from Do It. She's a Chief Technology Officer and Overall Status Technology in Illinois Century Network. Thank you. Yep, got it. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for allowing me to come speak with you regarding the Illinois Century Network. My name is Lori Sorensen. I am the Chief Technology Officer for the Department of Innovation and Technology. Uh, with me today sitting uh, back there is Jennifer Ricker, our Chief of Staff. So the Illinois Century Network, also known as the ICN, is a high-speed broadband network serving K-12, higher education, public libraries, museums, state and local government, and broadband service providers. The ICN provides internet and intranet connectivity for more than 3,500 sites statewide, ensuring high availability for cloud-based content, disaster recovery services, data, fiber, video, I'm sorry, services, data, video, and audio communication. The ICN offers more than 20 services that include internet access, virtual private network connections, dark fiber and optical wave service, content filtering, private WAN monitoring, and security services such as DDoS mitigation, intrusion detection, malware prevention, vulnerability scanning, and 24 by 7 security monitoring. The ICN is also the designated network for connecting government and education entities to the Internet 2, which is the nation's research network. ICN has developed a positive reputation among community and anchor institutions for a high availability network and responsive and knowledgeable technical staff. ICN provides local customer support through nine regional technology centers staffed by experienced engineers. The ICN was created in 1997 with the recommendation from the Higher Education Technology Task Force to create a single statewide education network. At that time, the ICN was primarily a lease network, meaning the ICN purchased backbone circuits on typically one to five year terms from commercial service providers. With the award of $96 million in federal and, straight, and state grant funds in 2010, the network was upgraded from lease circuits to fiber owned and operated by the state. With the grant award, approximately 1,000 miles of fiber was constructed, constructed and another 1,000 miles purchased from service providers on long-term leases. Last mile circuits from the ICN fiber to the customer location are predominantly leased circuits from service providers, with the exception of about 60 fiber-based connections that were included in the 2010 grant project. Following the upgrade, the ICN expanded its customer base and began selling dark fiber leases, lit service, and co-location service to service providers in addition to the ICN standard customer base of state agencies and community anchor institutions. From 1999 to 2015, ICN was owned and operated by the Illinois Department of Central Management Services. With the signing of House Bill 5611 in July of 2018, do it was made an official state agency and transferred governance of ICN to do it. 
From 1999 to 2015, ICN funding was partially provided by state appropriation. For fiscal year 1999, funding provided by the state appropriation was $27 million, which covered all costs for providing internet service to K-12, higher education, libraries, and museums. Gradually, the state funding decreased and eventually ended in 2015, requiring customers to pay all costs associated with ICN services. Over the past two years, ICN has received state and or federal funding for specific projects. Beginning in 2018, the ICN received funding to provide secure internet services to 108 local election authorities as part of the Cyber Navigator program. Federal funding from the Help America Vote Act flows to the State Board of Elections to fund the costs associated with providing the secure internet connectivity. The fiscal year 2020 state budget includes funding to provide all public K-12 schools with bandwidth speeds to meet their education and administrative needs and secure student information. The funding includes 20 million from Rebuild Illinois for capital improvements to the network, plus a 10 million appropriation for operational costs. Starting July 1, ICN began waiving service charges for the 1,600 public K-12 schools currently connected. The remaining schools will transition to the ICN over the next two to three years. Once all public schools are connected, the needed annual state appropriation is 25 million, leveraged with 40 million in federal E-rate funds. The elections and K-12 network are examples of how we can leverage the ICN to share resources among state and local organizations in a secure and cost-effective manner. Other opportunities to leverage the ICN and state fiber is for increasing demands of Internet of Things technology. The, the state-owned fiber is installed along the highways and interstate, which can be leveraged for autonomous vehicles, smart street lighting, video cameras, sensors, and 5G, to name a few. Open access fiber will continue to support the growing state's digital economy. Service providers are leveraging the state's fiber to expand into new communities, creating competition and choice. The ICN will remain focused on directly serving education, government, and libraries while working with service providers to leverage the state's fiber resources to expand broadband access, improve broadband speeds, and support a growing array of Internet of Things technologies. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. So currently is the state of Illinois do it is anything on 5G? I'm just curious. No. So we are a uh, fiber based network mm -hmm. and we provide wireline services. Okay. Can you, since you're here, can you tell us a little bit about the broadband expansion that the governor is trying to do throughout the state of Illinois? I would appreciate that. I will try my best, and we have a couple uh, members of the committee also serve with me on the Broadband Advisory Council, which we uh, just held our first uh, council meeting a, a week or so ago. So the project, uh, the capital funds are $420 million. $28 million is specific to the ICN um, refresh. The other 400 million um, will be used in most likely in grants that uh, will be administered by the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, and that will be used um, to expand broadband into unserved and underserved areas. Uh, the program also includes um, the establishment of a broadband office within the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, so we can continue to focus on this on a full-time basis and work at um, the whole array of issues that are kind of um, the challenges uh, for broadband expansion. Some of it is uh, the high cost of expanding broadband, which the grant will help. Um, some of it is access issues, uh, rights of way, challenges with rights of way that uh, make it costly and, uh, and uh, uh, extend out the time for providers. Um, others have to do more with adoption and um, not only adoption by folks in their homes to use broadband, but it's it's also um, to extend out and accelerate the application of telehealth applications, distance learning, um, and so those are all areas that we want to kind of uh, focus on. The uh, council has established uh, some working groups, um, let's see, telehealth, uh, economic development, access, technology and infrastructure, and education. And so over the month of September, those working groups will convene, gather input um, from a variety of sources 
services and come back and present a set of recommendations and finding to the council, which will uh, inform a report that the council will provide to the governor by the end of this year. Thank you. Um, I know your spokesperson, would you have any questions? Representative, any members and questions for do it? Um, all right, thank you very much. It's much appreciated. You're welcome. Thank you. Also, I want, the, with the next speaker coming up, I do want members to know that we did receive close to 100 and a few hundred up letters instead of printing them all out uh, if any members want access to them uh, just let us know and we will email them all to you we did print out some of the powerpoints uh, but just save some trees we didn't print them all out but please let us know and we'll, we'll forward all the emails to you so you, you may uh, have access to them next we have from the concerned citizens we have dr paul i'm sorry i pronounced your last name probably ron horrocks Hurricks. Please correct me. Uh, from McGill University, professor of toxicology and health effects of electromagnetism. I do, I hate to start this way, but you know, I, um, one, one of the, I, you should know that one of the advocates unfortunately sent out an email, and I just want your thoughts on what you think about this. Um, since I believe your time is valuable and our time is valuable, that this is nothing but a dog and pony show. If it is, do you, do you believe that they should have at least let you know that you're going to waste your time in a dog and pony show? Mr. You can turn on the... Mr. Chairman, I don't think this is a dog and pony show. I think speaking with you and this committee is a great privilege, and I hope that you uh, hear what I have to say. Right, thank you very much for your time. And don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll take into consideration if there's questions here in, in your time. Uh, please state your name uh, and your, your affiliation, and, um, and then we'll proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Heroux. I'm a PhD, and I am supported by the Faculty of Medicine, essentially, to uh, defend public health, that is, your health and the health of the people of Illinois. Uh, I am here in particular because I am one of the very few people that you will meet who has actually done experiments on the effects of human cancer cells and electromagnetic radiation. Most people deal with this uh, from the point of view of literature. You know, they read things. I have actually done some research on this personally. Uh, I, uh, I was trained as a physicist. I worked for industry for 10 years as a researcher, and I was hired by telecommunications companies like Nortel and Siemens as an expert to assess the impact of their equipment on health. I currently teach health effects of electromagnetics, electromagnetism, and toxicology at the graduate level at McGill University in Montreal. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit uh, about 5G. Yes, it is. It, this is a handout that I will uh, refer to uh, during my talk. So I want to start a little bit by talking briefly about 5G because I'm not sure that all of you are familiar with some of the technical details. 5G is specific, as you can see on the first page of the top, at the top, in that it has beam forming, which means that the radiation from 5G is more concentrated in certain directions. It is also at higher frequencies uh, that is expected to be, and you can see that uh, in the bottom pictures. And and because these frequencies are expected to be higher, they have less penetration in the body, which means that their heat is more concentrated on the surface of the body. Uh, what is really promoted by industry in relation to 5G is uh, two things. That is uh, higher data rates and less latency. Latency being the delay between a command and a response from the system. So 4G, the network that is already in use in most Western, uh, uh, most of the Western world, ranges from 0.15 to 1 gigabytes per second. Uh, 5G ranges from 1 to 10 gigabytes per second, which is an increase 
increased by a factor of uh, 10. So 5G is an evolution rather than a revolution. So a film that could download in less than 30 seconds on 5G, uh, while the same operation would take six minutes on the older network. But of course, this is a film that would last about two hours. So uh, we have to keep in perspective what the usefulness of that is. On the subject of latency is where 5G promises to deliver the largest improvement. Uh, on 4G, there is a delay of about 50 milliseconds between a command and a response. But uh, the, uh, the reflexes of a human uh, in, re in reaction time are about 250 milliseconds for a visual stimulus, 170 milliseconds for an audio stimulus, and 150 milliseconds for a touch stimulus. So this means that this improvement in latency is, is essentially main, uh, aimed at machine interaction. When a machine is on the other end, this is a great, great, great advantage. So this is great for machine-to-machine -machine interactions. Uh, and I think that within the confines of an industrial plant, this is almost indispensable if you want to use wireless for data transmission. But low latency is not the exclusive of 5G. You could have low latency through optical fiber or through cable, and with much better reliability because of lack of noise. Anything that you broadcast as electromagnetic radiation is vulnerable to electromagnetic pulses and to interference. So this, this low latency is primarily of use to an industrial engineer within the confines of a plant. Unfortunately, there are undesirable uh, consequences to 5G. One consequence is that it would need to deploy many more antennas much closer to homes and businesses. Although this is presented as a way to deliver more data, it is also as a way to retrieve data from homes and businesses, mostly in the context of the Internet of Things. Internet of Things emitters may not have a lot of power, so you need an ear that is closer to the source to gather all of this data. So picture antennas everywhere in sight, some of them hidden from sight, to support what I describe as 5G global microwaving. And this means that microwaves will be relatively powerful most everywhere. A second consequence of 5G is that radiation limits that are currently in force in the US would have to be increased 30 to 40 percent to accommodate this new system. The city of Brussels in Belgium has already refused the deployment of this technology based on expected health effects. The third thing is that 5G is a poor solution compared to optical fiber because it is much slower and fills the environment with radiation that biological organisms, all of them, are not adapted to live in. So some people would like to create the illusion of a race to 5G. This is a commercial race. It is not a technical race. Technology is, active, is actually a menu. You can favor the development of some things that can substitute for others. So what I want to emphasize is that you have a choice here. Optical fiber confines signals completely rather than broadcasting them, so there is no radiation at all. Its speed and reliability cannot be approached by 5G. Bell Labs has recently demonstrated internet speeds of 10 million gigabytes per second over two kilometers. This is 10 million times faster than 5G can deliver. The reliability of an optical connection, if well protected mechanically, I'm not talking about the tree falling on the line, is one failure every 35 years for a fiber going 3.5 times around the Earth. This is unique technology. 
optical fiber to the homes and businesses would reduce the name for wireless because of its capacity and is truly the future in terms of fast data transfers. A modern society needs optical fiber. Now I want to talk about the safety factors connected to wireless that are put in place by the federal government to protect the American people. The American pu public has no functional regulation at all at the moment protecting it from electromagnetic radiation. And history proves that. The standard that the FCC promotes has been repeatedly upgraded to protect changes in equipment as opposed to protecting people. In 1975, in New York State, there was a decision with the Swimline Corporation that prevented workers from being protected, even from the lax FCC standards, from a technicality of law. In other words, there is not the legal muscle in this country to protect people from electromagnetic radiation. There are uh, many things in this standard that do not make any sense. It was accommodated that the extremities would be allowed to be subjected to much more radiation simply to protect a particular model of industrial heater that could be upgraded very, very easily to reduce exposure to workers. The FCC has not done this. It's had, it has promoted higher exposures for the extremities. When the ear was recognized to have exposures that were too high because of the standard, the FCC simply reclassified it as an extremity. When it was realized that children had not been taken into account in the standard for heat delivered to their brain, this new knowledge was entirely ignored by the FCC. Cell phone manufacturers are allowed to choose the di distance at which heating to the brain is actually measured. These measurements are very, very inaccurate and essentially are not monitored by anyone except the manufacturers. You may refer to what is called the phone gate. What happened when the French government started to investigate the radiation from these devices, they found that many, many of them were exceeding their specifications. Because of the higher frequency of 5G, it is less penetrating, and so this leads to more concentration on heat on the superficial parts of the body. Uh, in fact, the FCC is preparing to eliminate the old metric by which we evaluate exposure, and to, which was SAR, specific absorption rate, and to replace it with power density to accommodate 5G. So industry has no interest in the health impacts of its radiation, unfortunately. Industry is completely concentrated on selling more cell phones in particular. And as the testimony uh, of industry executives in response to the questions of Senator Blumenthal, who asked the industry, have you done any investigation on the subject of health effects of 5G? The answer is that they have done absolutely none. This is called essentially uh, FCC overreach. More than 90 cities and counties have joined together in a lawsuit currently before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals arguing that the FCC has overstepped its authority in 5G deployment rulings. In issues are health, deployment on public property, short delays, and small rental fees. This is FCC overreach. So why is the FCC believing that it can overreach? Well, cellular phones are a spectacular commercial success. This allowed industry to heavily promote and perfect their product. While I was a consultant for the telcos, the big objective was to hide completely the antennas within the cell phone so that consumers would never be reminded that it emitted radiation. 
industry, secondly, has gained complete control over the over U.S. government institutions like the FCC that in principle should police it essentially by the appointment of industry people in key positions. This has long been known to create disastrous effects in societies, and I am directing you to the wisdom of Adam Smith, the apostle of capitalism, warning us that the merchants should not be making the rules as they are doing now in the United States. No one enforces the safety standards of the FCC. People who do not have measuring uh, equipment for radiation are unaware of their exposures. In a sense, what you don't know cannot hurt you. I submit that many dangerous substances share this characteristic. Slow lead intoxication is one. It's very difficult to detect in people who are slowly intoxicated or in the, in the clinic. Then the standard of exposure of the FCC does not even stand up in court. So industry is perfectly justified in feeling invulnerable. Industry is so confident of its position that it maintains no expertise or interest in monitoring any radi uh, health impacts of electromagnetic radiation. And this was dramatized by uh, the question of Senator Blumenthal. So uh, the FCC has been overreaching on the subject of EMR health effects for decades. This is not a new phenomenon. Essentially, the process of se setting safety standards was elaborated between institutions such as the American National Standards Institute, the Institute of Electronics and Electrical Engineers, and the Federal Communications Commission. All engineering outfits, a whole industry was pitted against a small number of isolated academics who tried to uh, produce evidence for the effects of electromagnetic radiation. The process undermined science by diluting scientists with a large number of industry employees or chosen sympathizers occupying positions on critical committees. This process can be des described as active denial of the true effects of electromagnetic radiation, meaning the, that the process was controlled to lead to an inevitable conclusion that would promote the deployment of devices, not the protection of people. The safety standard recognizes nothing but heat as an agent. The heat delivered to people is averaged over a gram or 10 grams, while cancer comes from a single cell. Industry in the past has only funded work on heat because it wanted to promote this variable because it knew that it would lead to very high exposure standards. What do we know from science? I have conducted personally uh, research to check whether the standard promoted by the NCC makes sense or not. And just to uh, point this out to you briefly. On the second page below Adam Smith, you have a diagram. You have four diagrams. At the top of the diagram is where the line that is on each of these diagrams should stay if the FCC is right. What these diagrams describe is the loss in human cancer cells, leukemia, breast cancer, lung cancer, as well as colon cancer as a result of exposures to radiation much below the FCC standard. So if you compare pre-industrial levels of radiation to the levels we have now, there is a clear effect on all major human cancers. A second aspect of this radiation that I have documented is on the next page, and it concerns what are called reactive oxygen species. Exposure to this radiation, especially irregular radiation, promotes the concentration of reactive oxygen species. Those are agents that are aggressive to biological systems and essentially load up physiology. What this means is that 
we have here proof with experiments that exposure to the electromagnetic environment as we know it now increases the load on human beings and on all living systems in nature, which means that a lot of diseases that are produced over long periods of time will increase in frequency and will occur earlier. So this is very important. What evidence do we have from animal experiments? Well, it is remarkable that with the accumulation of big studies of animal, on animals that confirm that the exposure from wireless radiation from cellular phones is deleterious, that the FCC can still get away with not making any changes. You have here the result of Chu published in 1992 that described the quadrupling of cancer rates in animals exposed to radiation. You have on the next page the result of uh, Ripacholi, which described a doubling on the cancer rate, and I will point out that he has only a doubling in this report because the mice that he used were susceptible to uh, leukemia at a high rate to start with. And below the Ripacholi uh, results, we have a description of the very recent National Toxicology Program uh, uh, results. This is the hardware that they use in this $30 million study. The results were released this year. The NTP found clear evidence of carcinogenicity from signals of cell phone radiation. So what the NTP study is telling you is that your cell phone is giving you cancer. There is another study on the next page performed in Europe by the Ramazzini Institute in Italy which tells you that cell phone towers will give you cancer. So those are major animal experiments, they are summarized below, that prove that this radiation is not as innocuous as the FCC would have you believe. What evidence that we have from human populations? On the next page, I have two monographs of about 300 pages each, published by the International Agency for Research on Cancer in Lyon, France. These reports essentially say that all artificial electromagnetic radiation is connected with higher incidences of cancer. Below that, you have the uh, comments of Anthony Miller of the University of Toronto, who is saying that electromagnetic radiation should be classified as a class one carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and I have confidence that this will happen. With the digital signals coming from cellular phones, we have rather suddenly created a population of people that we call the hypersensitive. They are hypersensitive to electromagnetic fields. These people, the most sensitive ones, cannot leave their homes that they have shielded for radiation because they cannot tolerate the effects. It is true that this is a small percentage of the population. In Sweden, there is a software that you can download from the internet that allows a person to draw a path between two points where he wants to go to avoid a radiation exposure at the maximum. This software was downloaded 200,000 times. So to various degrees, there are many people throughout the world who suffer the rather immediate effects of this radiation. This is different from the- Can you come to a conclusion so we could start asking some questions? Yes. I know you, you have to catch a flight, so yes. I know the members would like to ask some questions. So the, the process of uh, standardization of electromagnetic radiation was hijacked by people who had an interest in maximizing the market value of their product, which is understandable. The biologists became so disenchanted with this that they produced their own report called the Bioinitiative Report that proposed a different standard of exposure that would actually protect people. This was essentially uh, pushed by by uh, Dr. Uh, David Carpenter of the Uni University of Albany and Dr. Henry Lai of the University of Washington. 
there are standards that are even more uh, strict than the bioinitiative suggestions by the Austrian Medical Association and by the European Academy for Environmental Medicine. The second uh, aspect that I'd like to talk about is the fact that Essentially, the FCC is overreaching in privacy. To engineers, privacy is not a natural concept. They believe that if we can gather data from the air, we own this data. And IoT, unfortunately, is slated to allow large organizations who have the means to do so to retrieve data from your companies and from your homes in quantity. And the problem with IoT that is, in a sense, supported by 5G is that it sets the stage for something like this. Lastly, I would like to uh, cite a um, statement by Marshall McLuhan who says that the medium is the message. So what this means essentially is that you have to be careful of what you build because even if it's not intended when you build it, it will be used. In this case, the medium is the 5G deployment of antennas to serve Internet of Things. The message is with 5G IoT, you will allow retrieving, retrieval using wireless devices of every bit of information that, that large organizations can get out of you and perhaps then sell it. So this leads to you being known better by others than by yourself. This is important because it's an erosion of personal identity, which, mean, which leads to alienation and a loss of confidence in the system. I think it is unwise to deploy this. I think that wireless retrieval of information should only be allowed with full respect of information ownership. This is not the plan of IoT. The plan of IoT is to get as much as possible. I would urge you to heavily favor the superior technical solution of optical fiber over wireless. It is better, not only from the point of view of economics, it is better from the point of view of human health, and it is better from the point of view of privacy. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Now, Doctor, radio frequency. English. Radio frequencies have been around forever. Yes. For example, AM. Yes. That's, it's, it's a very, yes. very, very strong signal. That's why we only need one antenna compared to all these micro, with all these 5Gs. So AM has been around forever. Yes. Have there been studies that the AM causes the, the cancer? Yes. Okay. Now, In other words, all types of electromagnetic radiation are, are disturbing to biological systems, but we believe that the pulse radiation that, that have come recently with cellular telephones are substantially worse. So in the past, the environment that we had had a mild effect on health. Now this is being accelerated because of the new type of signals. Right. Now, is that, is that if you hold the, I saw a little article on Chicago Tribune that they just had on, uh, on cell phones and the FCC. The, do you, now the AM waves are such more in amplitude, they're some, such stronger and higher. Do, would, would you consider the AM waves actually have a greater effect on the body than the, the 5G waves? No, I think the AM waves, because they are continuous waves, are less biologically active to the body. 
And unfortunately, many of the good ideas of engineers, because after all, pulsing radiation is a great idea from the point of view of rapid data transfer. In the same way that beamforming improves the ability to transport many uh, types of radiation at the same time. But unfortunately, these ideas are not compatible with the physiology of human systems. They are more deleterious than what we use privately, uh, previously. So if we confine it in optical fiber, we get everything we want and none of the inconveniences. We all need wireless, but wireless, in a sense, should be tamed and optical fiber should be preferred. I know you're not an attorney, but um, I'm just wondering, are you familiar, is there has been any case law that already um, individuals have been able to win regarding radio frequency waves based on that they directly cause cancer on them? Yes, it, it has been done. The person who maintained the, uh, the emission towers on the top of the Empire State Building in New York was compensated. But this is a rather isolated incident. But I can tell you there are many lawyers who are waiting for the right moment to uh, build class action lawsuits because they believe that with the NTP, with Ramazzini, with the International Agency for Research on cancer, they have a high chance of becoming successful. Right, right. So that, besides an employee that is next to an extremely, extremely powerful antenna from the top of the Empire State's building would be the fact that, I mean, here, my uncle was the uh, chief engineer for an Ecuador for an Earth Station. Now, he unfortunately had to stand in front of that Earth Station, you know, a lot. So, there, I mean, that was... It's bigger than this, you know, uh, huge room, that antenna. I mean, the size of a football field. But it, has there been instances where there have been cases of, of uh, besides a direct employee being constantly bombarded by waves, has there now been instances of, 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 of case, case law or anything that has shown use of everyday use. I mean, here are the, geez, I mean, microwaves, all that stuff emits. And people, because I know I've been, I've been hearing this, I'm just wondering, people still keep using microwaves. So is, is it just, is, is it, all, all this stuff uses radio frequency every time we walk out and, and so I'm just trying to figure, there must be studies on, on the use of microwave and, and the food. I mean, just, I mean, microwaves have been around for a while. Why have we not getting rid of microwaves? Well, the microwaves, in the case of an oven, are confined, and there have been some good designs of doors to confine the microwave within a cavity. So if you're not exposed, there's no problem. You know, in, uh, in, in periods of war, you need wireless in quantity, because that's the way, you know, armies work. So there is a place for microwaves and for wireless in society is just that with the evidence that we have, it is the time to tame it, make sure that we can reduce exposures to people so they don't suffer any consequences, yet get powerful data transfer techniques like optical fiber uh, supported. Also with, with 5G, is it basically if there's anything in front of it, uh, I'm, I know I'm, I'm not going to steal a question from Representative, but I'm just curious, uh, Representative Stilcorn mentioned, it's very direct. I mean, you, if there's anything in front of you, there's a tree in front of you, or a window yes. in front of you. Rains, raindrops can interrupt it, essentially, right. and it's much more volatile. So if you're in, so if you're in your house, that window or anything else, would it block the 5G from coming in your house? They plan essentially to increase the, uh, the, the intensity of the beam to try to punch through barriers, which in a sense is a problem because uh, these radiation are not as easily propagating as the lower frequencies, so they need to essentially yell louder to get the signal through, and as well, it is not reliable. It is blocked by uh, 
leaves, it is blocked by rain, and so on and so forth. If you compare this to the reliability of optical fiber, there is no comparison. But deploying 5G will allow the sale of a new generation of cell phones, and it will be followed by 6G, because industry will want to sell a new generation of cell phones. So what I'm trying to say, it's not driven by demand or by necessity, it's demand, it's driven by the needs of an industry. Thank you. And, uh, just, I know, I'd like to also recognize Senator Cunningham, uh, who came in, and I don't know if he wants to be recognized, but I'm going to recognize him anyways. I think I see for uh, Alman Mad O'Shea out there from the 19th wards of his constituents are listening. He's here uh, paying attention, and he's, uh, he's out here. So I just, uh, as a former sergeant of Arm City Council, just want to say welcome, good friend over there from the 19th ward. Uh, minority spokesman, uh, you have a question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for coming and, and giving us your, your testimony today. Um, a couple of questions here regarding uh, some of the science here, and there's a lot to absorb here. So you brought a lot, and there's plenty of information coming from all directions. Our offices are getting people inquiring about this, so I'm glad we're having this discussion today. Um, my question, my first question has to do with, with, the, with the diagram I got from, from another source here regarding uh, Ionizing versus non-ionizing radiation. Can you tell me how the, what the difference between those two are and, and how I should interpret that? Okay. Essentially, industry, when it devised a standard for non-ionizing radiation, recognized that this, uh, a lot of science and a lot of the American public was still under the emotion of the Second World War and Hiroshima. And the U.S. government <coughs> invested a tremendous amount of resources into understanding the health effects of ionizing radiation. This, so to speak, biased the whole field of science towards being very sensitive to this particular mechanism. So it was relatively easy for industry who wanted to use wireless to use this very simple argument to claim that if it cannot break molecules, it cannot affect living systems. But the mechanisms by which electromagnetic radiation works are not the same as ionizing radiation. So the distinction between the two, the two is a physical reality, but in terms of health effects, it does not prove at all that non-ionizing radiation is innocuous. Okay. I want to ask you a question here because I don't know how much time we've got here regarding uh, the, you mentioned a process or part of your testimony had to do with 5G antennas listening mm -hmm. to what are they listening to? They will listen to everything that you've bought because in the future the plan of industry for functionality and for data acquisition is to put a radio frequency emitter in everything that you buy. If you look at the declarations of Tom Wheeling, he says we will put billions of them in pillboxes and, and waterers. So the plan of industry, since you've got an internet connection in your computer, is to have every object possible. What apparently Wheeler doesn't realize is that this will create a sea, a dense sea of electromagnetic radiation first that will make talking between them very very difficult, and secondly, saturate our environment to the point where it will be more designed for microprocessors than for people. I just want to make sure everybody's clear. He's not talking about this wheeler, he's talking about a different wheeler. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I appreciate it. So the, the, the person still who who's, who has a 5G into their house and maybe listen, you know, it, it, it's just up to accept signals. Those signals would be broadcast by a device within their home. That they paid for. That they paid for. So and Amazon, they will no Echo, longer those own this information because the antenna will be on public property owned by somebody else. With optical 
fiber. The fiber comes in your home. You buy the router. I understand. I understand your, your comparison. There are a little bit of apples and oranges here. One is a wireless mobile technology. The other one is, is a fixed technology, which would require an access point at each different location. Um, so I understand your, your points well taken about what is you know a, a delay difference between a, a safer technology from your perspective versus one that has questions regarding the, the wireless frequency part of it. Um, and the last question I want to ask you real quickly, because I know other people might want to ask other questions, has to do with the, the, the litigation process here. I mean, 4G has been off for some time now. 3G was up before that. Um, those uh, signals that are used, those frequencies, uh, I would assume that at some point in time, if, if there was something that could be done on the litigation lines, it would have happened by now. Is, am I missing something there? or is You're not missing something. I know more lawyers than I know people at this point. Oh, so we're in the, the same business. The, the thing is that a large lawyer firm will only get into this if they are certain that they can win. One of the problems is documenting exposure. We can document a cancer. We can document Parkinson's. Prove that you were exposed for the last 10 years to this radiation. But instruments to do exactly that are becoming available at very at $200. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll just ask questions. I have more. We can get to it later on, but I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Vice Chairman John Carr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Doctor, thank you very much for making the trip down uh, and helping us to, to understand these, uh, these issues surrounding 5G. Uh, I did want to say I completely agree with you on fiber optics. Um, and being part of the Broadband Advisory Council, I intend on pushing more, more and more fiber optics uh, installations here in Illinois. <laughs> However, um, my question today is, you covered a number of different topics, um, and I, I hope I'm not paraphrasing here, but it seemed to me that a, a, a large aspect of the danger that you have spoken about today involves the actual use of cell phones themselves, which is a separate issue from 5G technology. So just uh, for those of us who are trying to follow some of the various points that you made um, today as you spoke, could you rank in terms of priority or in terms of, of danger um, the different things that you talked about today. One, the use of personal cell phones devices close to our bodies. Two, uh, the existing 4G uh, cell towers. What, what types of dangers do they provide? And then the background, both the background radiation that we normally experience, Wi-Fi, uh, microwave ovens, radio stations, et cetera, some of the things that have been already spoken about. Out, um, and then and then compare those existing to 5G and what would be the difference if 5G was added into the radiation that we already experience? What a great question. <laughs> so in terms of the use of cellular phones, the health aspect that is most heavily documented essentially by Leonard Hardell of Sweden, an epidemiologist, is that bringing microwaves close to your brain will increase the chance of brain cancer. And even if the rate of brain cancer is not increasing very much, the rate of very malignant brain cancers has. Secondly, if you talk to Tony Miller of the University of Toronto, he will tell you he's very worried that brain cancer is becoming the most frequent cancer among children and that the rate of increase is accelerating. What this means is that these cancers have a long incubation period. You need to be exposed for a while before the, cons before the consequences are known. And for our children, we have been exposed to this radiation for a fraction of our lives. Children will be exposed all of their lives. This gives epidemiologists nightmares. Especially because cell phones have not been designed to minimize exposure to electromagnetic radiation. I can design a phone that with minor changes in your habits and it's the structure of the phone will reduce your exposure by a factor of 100. 
but it's not done. So, and then going back to my original question, but the, the change uh, from, from the implementation of 5G, what type of factor are we talking about in terms of difference between what we already have? Okay, so what we can document is only the impact of radiation from the past. We don't know for sure what the impacts of 5G, but we can surmise on the basis of the fact that there will be increased levels of radiation associated with the particular antennas used and the frequencies used. Secondly, industry wants to increase our use of wireless and of cellular phones because it is in their interest to do so. I recognize they have a right to try to promote this, but I also would like to submit that how much we use wireless is in great part a question of lifestyle. We can choose to do more things with a connection that is hundreds of times or thousands of times faster at home versus trying to do everything on the run. Maybe we need to have brief conversations. Maybe we need to send text messages. We need critical information. We don't need to download 3D movies on a bus. But industry would like to drive the population towards these habits because it means more for them. And it's their right. They're trying to commercialize a product. I cannot accept, however, the risks that it entails to people. Thank you. Representative Skilicorn. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, in an ideal world, would you advocate the FCC regulate 5G and 4G? Uh, at the moment, the FCC is the only agency that is uh, enabled with regulation. I think it has done a very poor job of it because it has resided completely. The whole uh, process of regulation has always been under the authority of engineers from the American National Standards Institute, from the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, to the Federal Communications Commission that doesn't have any staff specialized in health. The FCC is a spectrum allocation agency. They sell authorizations with great profit to the federal government, but they are unconcerned with health. And it's not even that the FCC denies it have no interest in it at all because they come from a tradition in which this is not an issue. Issue for them is technical development of means of communication through wireless. This is what is important to them. Okay, but the, I mean, you look at 5G and 4G from a regulatory standpoint, pretty similar, right? You, you would prefer that they be, I think you, you use the term, uh, uh, well, you, use the, you, use the, you stated that they should be uh, more restrained than they currently are, correct? Absolutely. Uh, the, in countries where they have levels a thousand times lower for the general environment than the United States, they have perfect functional cell phone systems. This country has adopted much higher levels of radiation for no functional reason, simply because there was a religion among the engineering community that this radiation does nothing at all to anyone. And they, the FCC has tried to maintain this religion over time, and I think we'll continue to do this as long as it has the mandate. Thank you. Is there any other members that would like to, any other questions? Oh. So, if the, um, doctor, thank you very much. Uh, I know, um, just so wondering, you, you were moved up on your request because you have to, uh, take a flight, so I, I don't want people to think that I just wanted to get you in and out of here and get you out of the way, so it was by your request. Um, and just uh, just so everyone knows, we did give you a lot more time than regularly uh, allowed, but you almost had close to 50 minutes. So I just, 
uh, just want that to make sure that it goes on the record. Uh, and we have your information, and members, if they have other further questions, may they contact you uh, directly? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chalman, and I hope you didn't think it was a horse and pony show. No, I didn't, and I hope you didn't. I just, I'm just repeating what someone else said. Uh, but I, it wasn't. So we're going to thank you very much for your time. Uh, we're going to move on to business and tech experts, Beth Cooley from CTI Wireless Industry Association and Senior Director, and Jim Carlini from President Carlini and Associates. Thank you. Ladies first. Unless you guys have an agreement that I go. Do you mind if I go over? Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Beth Cooley. I am the Senior Director of State Legislative Affairs at CTIA. CTIA is the trade association for the U.S. wireless communications industry. Um, I understand you all have, it's a beautiful presentation, but we're going to do handouts today. Um, and I'd like to speak from these handouts with the indulgence of the chair. Um, essentially, my goal here today is to educate you all on sort of where is the wireless industry today, focus on Illinois, and where are we going in the future and how do we get there. So uh, moving on to handout two, this is just a sampling of CTIA's membership. We represent the nation's wireless carriers. We also represent the device manufacturers, their suppliers and app companies as well. So moving on to handout three, this is just a snapshot of wireless in Illinois today. As you can see from these statistics, over 221,000 jobs, that's the number of jobs that the wireless industry supports here in Illinois. 22.9 billion with a B, that's the, um, the amount that the industry generates for the GDP of Illinois. And 13.6 million, that's the number of wireless subscriber connections in Illinois. So what that means is that there are actually one million more wireless devices than there are people in Illinois. So if you move to the next handout, this is what we call the, the hockey stick graph. Um, the title is mobile data use almost doubles in one year. Now, believe it or not, you can still make a phone call with your wireless device, but the trend is towards insatiable demand for mobile data. As you can see on this chart, we, we calculate through our members through an annual survey that's available on CTIA.org what's happening with our, with our members. And so this is a calculation of mobile data. So we saw 28.58 trillion megabytes of data on our networks last year. That's the equivalent to 250 million people playing Fortnite for over 1,900 hours. So if you have kids, college, children, you understand that's a lot of data. So with this explosive data growth that's clearly occurring on our networks today, where are we going? And you know, how do we accommodate this demand? How do we ready our networks for the future? And on the next slide, we talk about 5G. 5G, or fifth generation, I'm sure you've heard the term, they will be five times as responsive as 4G networks, which means that the latency, which is the time between data sending and receipt, that's going to be reduced by five times, which makes 5G especially well suited for mission critical communications in areas like telemedicine, public safety, first response. 5G will also serve up to 100 times more devices than today's 4G networks, which means that previously unconnected objects can become connected, like streetlights, trash cans, parking meters, and crops. And finally, 5G will be 100 times faster, up to 100 times faster than 4G, which makes it a great backbone for bandwidth intensive technologies like AR, VR, high resolution images, and video. If you move to the next handout, 5G is also a really exciting time for economic development. According to Accenture, over the next seven years, 5G will, ge will generate three million new jobs nationally, contribute $500 billion to the US GDP. New wireless investment will uh, occur to the tune of $275 billion, and that's private money. That is not taxpayer dollars. That is $275 billion of my members' uh, investment, and $160 billion in smart city benefits and savings. 
And if you move to the next handout, well, those are national numbers from Accenture. They developed a formula that can allow you to look at various cities and the 5G benefits that will occur by cities or towns. And again, this is available on our website at ctia.org. And I just took a snapshot of a few cities uh, here in Illinois. So for example, here in Chicago, we're talking about over 25,000 jobs created over 2.2 billion in estimated network investment, again, private sector money, and over 4.1 billion in estimated GDP growth here in Chicago. So moving on to the next slide, talking about some of the benefits of 5G. You know, our imagination, our, our, our growth is only limited by our imagination here. And so I'm just gonna highlight a few sectors. A lot of this data is from a Deloitte study. Again, happy to provide you with that information. And we're gonna be looking at industrial and consumer IoT, connected cars or autonomous vehicles, I'm sure you've heard the, the term, and smart communities. So moving on to consumer and industrial IoT, healthcare is a really exciting area. I think regardless of where you fall in the healthcare debate, the Deloitte has found that wireless connectivity will not only save lives, it will also save $305 billion per year in healthcare costs. Public safety, this is another really exciting area where 5G can help save lives. A 60 second improvement time, uh, 60 second improvement in first responder response time translates to reduction of 8% in mortality. Uh, in California recently, we heard a uh, California fire chief testify to the fact that a fire doubles in size every 60 seconds. So imagine what an improvement, uh, what can be saved in an improved response time. On the next handout, we're looking at smart communities and connected cars. In the energy world, smart grids or wireless enabled energy distribution can help save $1.3 trillion in autonomous cars. Yes, it can reduce your carbon footprint and reduce your commute times, but we're talking about saving over 20,000 lives per year with autonomous vehicles. So how do we get there? How, how do we realize all of these benefits from 5Gs? And I'm on now on the handout, small cells, what's next? So this is where small cells enter the picture. Small cells about the size of a backpack that are placed on traffic signals or street lights, able to handle more data today, that explosive data growth I talked about, but also help provide the 5G services of tomorrow. Now I wanna be clear that those macro towers, those 200 foot macro towers you see along the side of the highway, those are not going away. Small cells complement that network by relieving some of the congestion on those towers. So that's why it's so uh, important to have a process for small cells to be deployed in a locality. So um, I talked a little bit about small cells. We're estimating about 800,000 need to be deployed by 2026. Now that's not here in Illinois, that's nationwide. So one other point I just wanna kinda hammer home is, I'm on the handout, small cell benefits increase capacity and reduce congestion. Small cells are important for 5G. They are a, a, a per important component of 5G, but they are being deployed today, just outside actually. There are a couple of small cells at the intersection behind this building. They are used to relieve congestion on today's network. So I just wanna be clear that yes, they are important for 5G, and those macro towers are important for 5G as well, but they're very important for today, for today's congestion congestion issues. And so finally, the last few handouts are just examples of small cells. Um, these pictures are pretty, but it's even better you have one right outside. Um, one I would draw your attention to is on the second to last page. This one is actually, it's a, a dark standalone pole. It's at the, actually on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., and it's difficult to see, and that's actually by design. It's all in one intended to blend into its environment. So while you see a lot of you know street lights, traffic lights, um, there are also numerous types of devices designs as well. So I threw a lot of information out at you. Um, that's my entire presentation, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. you know what I'm gonna do, I didn't realize, um, is Commissioner Jana Kern still here? For Chicago Department of Public Health? No, okay. Then you could just, uh, so um, I have a couple questions. Where exactly is 5G available and who, I mean, is, is it commercial? Is it, you know, I see a lot of commercials. 
maybe you, you can answer this, where, I mean, is it just downtown? Is it just, I know they're laying uh, stuff all over the state, but where can someone truly have 5G service on a cell phone? It's not like evolution or, or gonna be a, I know, I think I saw Verizon selling 5G phones, some adapters. Can you answer that question? I mean, who exactly is providing it? Where does it actually ex really exist? Truly 5G on a cell phone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's a great question. Or a so, hotspot. Um, our estimates are there will be 92 deployments for 5G by the end of 2019. So by carrier if you'd like me to do it. AT&T currently, to the best of our statistics, because I should add, these keep changing. Just at the beginning of this week, Sprint announced four more cities nationwide. So the most recent information I have, AT&T has 21 sites, T-Mobile has six, with nationwide coverage expected in 2020. Sprint has nine, including Chicago. US Cellular is expected the second half of 2019. Verizon is here in Chicago, as well as nine other cities. So that's where we are today, but um, I continuously check in with my, my communications department and that changes weekly. So that's the latest statistics I have. So, I mean, I'm sorry to get more and more specific, but I mean, is it, is, if I go to, if I'm only downtown Chicago, am I gonna get 5G service on my phone? If I go to a neighborhood just by Wrigley Field, am I, am I um, 5G? If I go to Rosemont, are we on 5G? I mean, who, I'm just trying to get down to the specifics where in Illinois 5G actually exists and actually you can get 5G where on my phone, if it says 5G, I don't have 5G, but I'm just trying to figure out down the specifics, I mean, where, who has it? I mean, is, is it really available right now? In the, co the media coverage that I've seen where they've done investigative reporting, where you are truly in a downtown area where it has been launched and you have a 5G phone, you have seen exceptional 5G speeds. So in this downtown, in the loop area, yes, you, with a 5G phone, yes, you should be experiencing 5G. And I'm sure my members would be happy to chat with you further. The issue is, is that if you watch the nightly news or primetime TV, this is a very competitive area. So to talk about um, their speeds or where they may be deploying, it's, it can be somewhat sensitive. But my understanding is in the major downtown areas where it's been deployed and if you have the correct equipment, it is, it is working. So realistically, is it just downtown Chicago and the whole state of Illinois, or is it in St. Louis market? I mean, I just, I mean, well, I'd be happy to read you some I mean, of Is there a chance we can get a, if the members can get an actual map of where it actually exists? I mean, that would be very useful for the, all members to find out if, if, the, if there truly is 5G in, in their district or in their neighborhood. It just, I'm just trying to really understand who really has 5G and, and I know people advertise it, but is it is it truly 5G or eventually they have a 5G phone that can't have the capability of 5G, but they just bought a 5G phone that really one, one out of a million time and they're actually gonna be on 5G. Yeah, I, I think that we can get you that information to your first question um, in terms of speeds or, or maps or whatever you'd be interested in. I think I will say we are we are ahead of schedule, but we are just you know at the beginning of commercial deployments. You know, initially uh, 5G, you know, the standards came out earlier than expected, which was great. So we're deploying ahead of schedule, um, but we're still playing catch up because we still are doing small cell deployments for existing congestion issues. But we'd be happy to get you that information, Mr. Chairman. Where have they actually installed 5G at the, the cell towers? I'm, I'm sorry, could you? The cell towers for, that they're installing, I mean, where are they installed? Is it, you say, you, when you said, you said like it, uh, certain companies you said have 19 locations, 20 locations, is it literally 20 cell towers or 20 locations that have various cell towers? That's a great question. So it depends on what spectrum they're using. Um, if they're using the higher band millimeter wave, they're, they're likely deploying small cells. Uh, for some of the mid band spectrum, 5G can actually be in and 
antenna installed on an existing macro tower, which is a great rural solution. So when we're talking about, you know, say AT&T for the 21 cities, it's not just one tower in each city. Depending on what their network needs are, it could be small cells or, or adding on to existing towers or a combination of the, of the two. Do you know if when they do the installation of, of 5G cell towers in there, they're actually going to municipal government and actually telling them that they're installing, or is it just now that they've passed and say, well, no, they can install the cell towers, they just go ahead and don't have to notify the, the municipality? So for small cell applications, yes, applications still have to be filed with the municipality, so there's notice. Um, an application needs to be filled out properly, which would start a shot clock. Um, if an application is not complete, the locality would say, hey, you're missing information, the shot clock stops. So long and short of it is absolutely yes, there are still applications that need to go through local governments. Okay, thank you. Representative Wheeler, you have any question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, quickly, if you could, uh, you described a little earlier the fact that the f the current towers, the micro towers, you call them, uh, that we see, those aren't going away, and there's going to be involvement. So, tell me what the how 5G fits in that. When are we going to see 5G signals when we're driving down an interstate, or is it just going to be more in the densely populated urban and maybe suburban areas? The first, wa thank you for the question. The, fir the first wave is going to be where um, where the the network demands are. So, those are going to be your small cells where people congregate. So, it could be a downtown, it could be uh, a stadium, you know, where people are congregating if it's a concert, for example. Um, 5G will be in the future available, you know, on a macro tower for long distances or a standalone small cell on an interstate. As we're talking about autonomous vehicles, for example, you can't hit a dead zone and, and the car stops communicating. So in the longer term, yes, there, there will be full coverage, um, great rural solutions as well, particularly um, if we're talking about healthcare, or education, or, or any of those, uh, you know, silos. So the initial deployments, though, will be where the congestion and the network, need, network needs are. Okay, and you used to mention it's like the stadium situation. So this Bears game in Soldier Field tonight, a situation like that means that you'd be able to use your device as you normally do. Right now, if you go to a game like that, generally if you're trying to stream anything or follow something else is going to, the congestion is overwhelming. Is that the situation you accurately described? Absolutely, and um, I would be happy to speak with my members. I'm sh I would be pretty certain there are probably small cells today around Soldier's Field for that exact scenario you lay out. Okay, and then, uh, you know, I, I literally walked in the building today and I saw an advertisement for, I think Sprint had a 5G handset on the scrolling uh, board downstairs. Um, and you mentioned that there's a handful of, of uh, your industry uh, members that are rolling it out right now. And do we see that, what's the, what's the time frame for that to come to, like, you know, a, a more suburban area or a more rural area? Is, what, what's the, what's that, the timeline look like, I guess, is I'm trying to ask you. It's a great question. I have to sort of put on the lawyer hat, which I'm not, but if my attorney would tell me, I'm not privy to their future deployment plans, but my my speculation would be the suburban areas would be the sort of the next level of rollout. Just taking a step back, um, while 4G LTE today, that's today's existing network, covers you know 99% of the country, that's still being rolled out. So I, I see this as an ongoing 4G, 5G working together sort of deployment plan. I asked because you had on one of the slides that you uh, mentioned Aurora having 1,876 jobs created. Is it, I was trying to get an idea of what that time frame might look like. If that's over a long period of time, is it a permanent job, so it's construction jobs? If you can just give me some indication there, I'd appreciate that. Sure. Um, so these are both direct and indirect jobs. Um, by direct jobs, uh, I think a perfect example, Commissioner Carr, FCC Commissioner Carr, stated that you know workforce shortage is the biggest issue that we have right now. Um, some 30,000 jobs are needing to be filled to actually deploy these. So the folks that are actually trained to install these small cells. So those are direct jobs for those types, uh, for you know, Aurora specifically, but also indirect jobs. Um, the, the example that I like to use is, you know, if you're installing a small cell and you have a food truck that sets up outside to feed the folks who are putting the small cell up, that's also a job that was created that otherwise would not have existed. No, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director uh, Cooley, thank you for uh, coming and joining us. Uh, so a couple of questions. You, you threw out um, both small cell and 5G. So a small cell location may be only 4G. It isn't necessarily 4G, is that correct? Or 5G, sorry. Oh, um, if you see a small cell, well, it could be both 4G and 5G. It depends on, again, the provider's network needs. If they're filling a hole for the existing network, which is 4G, and it could also be 5G. So it could be both. Um, you would need to talk to the provider to determine, you know, a okay. specific. So I was on the impression that uh, when you see the 5G nodes, they're very specific. It's the three nodes that are the, don't the 5G. Um, and so, like, even these pictures here in N your presentation, I don't see those three 5G nodes, so I'm assuming that those are just 4G locations. Uh, is is my um, and maybe someone else in the, you know here can fill me in. Uh, am I incorrect in that it's the three nodes that designate the 5G? You are not incorrect, but there are different types of uh, small cells that do provide 5G. And I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned that. So I was going to ask about the frequency of, because you mentioned, well, you mentioned on the existing cell towers, which is a, a gonna, I think, I believe it's a different frequency than the, the localized nodes. Can you can you give me the specific frequencies for both applications? Um, so my, I'm not the spectrum expert, so we're kind of dancing around my expert. But my understanding is it's going to be the mid band and low band, so that broadcast 600 megahertz, 2.5 for the macro towers, where you can piggyback off of the, four, the macro tower and add an antenna for 5G as well. And, you know, every carrier owns different spectrum. It's all licensed. I'm sure you all are, are very aware of that. Um, so there's always the, the issue of interference that you need to be careful about. Um, if you're talking about maybe more than one provider on a pool for a small cell and also for a macro tower. So that's my general understanding of what will be utilized for 5G on macro is 2.5 and 600 megahertz. Okay, just but again, we're in. dancing around. So in a, previous to we, we started this, I had a conversation with the chairman about uh, 5G penetrating, you know, trees, buildings, uh, even raindrops. Uh, do you know if these macro towers, the frequency that operates, is that a situation where it'll penetrate a building or you know, penetrate behind trees? Or I, is the macro tower still only line of sight? I believe it's only line of sight, but I, but I do not have that information. I can get that for you. Okay, that would be very, very helpful, especially in this discussion about public health and safety. Because yeah. uh, you know, I do know from my research that the, the nodes, uh, which are the localized ones, I mean, they are line of sight. So uh, if you live by one, it's not in your house. I mean, if you fire up your 5G device uh, inside your home, it's not going to operate on 5G, and you're not getting those particular wavelengths. Uh, I'm curious about the macro tower, though, if that's the same, okay. or. Um, but I'm also be curious from industry experts if the speed, the, you know, the incredible speed we see from the localized nodes is as similar as the macro towers. That'd be fascinating. Okay. Uh, unless I come up with something else, I don't have any more questions. Does anyone have any questions for CTI? Representative Conner. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you for testifying today, Director Cooley. It's certainly uh, exciting to uh, to see the, the technology on, on its way out. Um, piggybacking off of Representative Skillicorn's question, um, there was some testimony from Dr. Haro uh, concerning what sounded to me like designs of technology um, that perhaps were designed in a way to minimize um, RF radiation or electromagnetic field radiation. Can you tell us about anything that's going on within the industry to do testing and to come up with designs that um, can try to uh, attempt to reduce those things uh, while at the same time delivering um, this, this broadband? Thank you, Representative. That's a great question, and I'm afraid I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have the expertise to answer that properly. So I'm happy to take that in-house and get back to you on it, because I do and not want to Maybe Dr. You. Eric Swanson could probably, or maybe even the next um, panel I, I, yeah, can answer I'll, that, too. I can too. answer that. Right, we'll wait for that one. Is there any more questions for Director Cooley? All right. Thank you, Thank Director. You. 
we'll move on to Jim Carlini. 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 Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Excuse me? The microphone is very direct, so you need the and the button there too. There you go. You can hear me now. I think so. Yeah. Can you Typical hear me now. Yeah. <laughs> hear me yeah. now. Uh, my name is James Carlini. I've been in this industry since 1977. I started Bell Telephone Laboratories in uh, real-time development of mission-critical networks. I was the mayor's consultant on the planning and design of the Chicago 911 Center that's now uh, named the OEMC. Uh, one of the big things we did with the city of Chicago, we were cutting edge long before anybody else. Back in 92 to 95 when I was there, uh, we installed fiber optics not only to the central offices, but to all 80 police and fire department buildings across the city. Uh, that has made the 911 center the best in the country based on using technologies that were way ahead of their time. I heard a lot of things today about uh, fiber optics and uh, smartphones and the issues of 5G and I want to clear up some of these things because um, we have to look at how do you go about designing all these networks and I've been designing networks and been working on mission critical infrastructure for over 40 years. I also worked on large intelligent building projects, large intelligent business campus projects, the 800-acre DePage Technology Park, where you have 40 gigabit speeds of fiber optics coming in. Uh, the whole thing is uh, we have to understand that today broadband connectivity is a huge issue in our lives. Uh, on the projects I've worked on, I've come to the conclusion that uh, broadband, uh, if you look at economic development, economic development equals broadband connectivity, and broadband connectivity equals jobs. The three most important words in real estate used to be location, location, location. I wrote a book on location, location, connectivity, because that's very important. It doesn't matter if you're in a residential area, a commercial area, or a city. If you don't have high-speed connectivity, you're not going to bring in and attract corporate facilities. You're not going to bring in and attract up and coming uh, professionals because everybody wants connectivity. And the whole issue about using fiber optics, uh, yeah, that's great to have fiber optics, but we've switched from uh, edge technology. Edge technology used to be desktops and laptops. Now the edge technology is a smartphone or a tablet. I want to be able to connect anywhere, and you can't do that with a fiber optic. You can't connect this up to a fiber optic. So the markets change, and because of that, uh, we've had to come up with new capabilities and much broader capabilities. And when we talk about um, a lot of um, new applications, it's not the companies that are driving this. It's the end users that are driving this where I want streaming video. If I go to a Bears game, I want to look at instant replay. I want to look at a player's background. If I go to Allstate Arena, I want to see something uh, on uh, my, my smartphone. The only way stadiums, whether it's Allstate Arena or the Bears Stadium, the only way they can keep up is if they put in all these new antenna that service these things. Because if you have 50, 60, 70,000 people at the Bears uh, Soldier Field, they're not going to get access if you had the traditional cellular towers that we've had in the past. So this has all evolved in the last five or ten years, basically the last five years. And so we need to look at this convergence of real estate, infrastructure, technology, and its impact on regional economic development. And if we uh, talk about... 
um, some of the things I have here. Um, we talk about the platform for commerce. That's infrastructure. We have an infrastructure bill in, in uh, the state of Illinois where we're talking about upgrading and improving infrastructure. But if you go around uh, and talk to everybody, everybody's got a different definition of what infrastructure entails. And um, you can't have everybody talking about infrastructure if it's only roads, bridges, maybe railroads, maybe airports. You have to have a comprehensive picture of what infrastructure is. And that I defined as a platform for commerce. That's also been adopted by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers as well as the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Oh, I also forgot, um, I was served 20 years as an adjunct professor at Northwestern University, both in the undergraduate division and the executive master's uh, uh, curriculum. But when we look at um, networks and we look at all these different issues, we need to understand that if we're going to compete, if we as a state are going to compete with other states, we need to make sure we have infrastructure that entices these companies to come in to build corporate facilities. And in the case of um, corporate site selection committees, in the last five or 10 years, uh, it used to be something where they take a look at certain areas. Now, broadband connectivity is one of the top 10, and probably one of the top two issues that they look at. And if you don't have that in the infrastructure, they move on to the next state. Now, 10 years ago, I was talking to the uh, mayor of Fort Wayne, and they did a lot in improving the infrastructure at Fort Wayne. They put in fiber optics to everything. And it was a uh, project with Verizon. It cost about $120 million to do. But it was a big thing because it had a huge payback. They spent that money, but they got about $5 billion back in um, economic development and building up companies that had long time moved out of Fort Wayne. And he said that in dealing with corporate site selection committee back then, they were looking at for broadband connectivity. And today, if we want to look at companies like Foxconn, which went up to Wisconsin instead, we need to look at improving our infrastructure and not holding back as far as uh, putting in things that can help us. And as far as the, you mentioned the Chicago Tribune uh, article, the one test that they did was that they took a look at cell phones and the one cell phone didn't work was the Apple i7. But the other ones that did work were the Samsung as far as the FCC requirements, but that was 15 millimeters. And if you go to two millimeters, yeah, they were emitting more radiation. But that's the same as saying you have a five mile an hour bumper on a car. And you say, oh, I crash it now at 20 miles, uh, 20 miles an hour, and the bumper didn't work. Well, that's not the manufacturer's fault. That's the standard that was set for that bumper. Same thing with smartphones. You know, if we need to increase the, um, the shielding within the phones or the shielding within the antenna, uh, that's something that we should take a look at. But, you know, we shouldn't change the requirement or change the testing criteria and then say, oh, it failed. You know, that's, that's not a valid test, and that would not hold up in, in court. I was an expert witness in civil and federal court for the last right. 30 years. It's, and it's just, if you could stay up there, we're going to just so we can move this along. Sure. Can we bring up Der uh, Dr. Eric Swanson, University of Pittsburgh, uh, professor of physics, to give his presentation to so both of you can be up there when we ask some questions. Okay. Thank you. No Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Please press the button over there, too. Push the button? Yeah. It's green now. Great. So, good afternoon. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Eric Swanson. I've been asked to talk to you about uh, health effects of electromagnetic radiation by CTIA. Um, I'm a professor of physics at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I've uh, published more than 100 publications on biophysics, condensed matter physics, and nuclear physics. 
I'm a fellow of the American Physical Society. I've authored two textbooks, both of which deal to some extent on this issue. Uh, and I'm a founding member of a topical group in the American Physical Society on hadronic physics. So I'd like to talk to you about electromagnetic radiation. I should stress that the word radiation, I call that the R word in my classes. Um, the radiation we're talking about is not nuclear radiation, which is quite different and very dangerous. Um, the electromagnetic radiation we're talking about is familiar to you as light, for instance. The light from these lights here, or the light outside from the sun. Um, radio waves, uh, x-rays, all of those are part of the same spectrum. Some of those uh, parts are dangerous. So you know that you shouldn't get x-rayed too often because the energy in x-rays is high. Um, gamma rays have even higher radiation and they are even more dangerous. Uh, luckily, you don't run into those often. If you're standing next to the core of a nuclear reactor, you might want to be careful. Um, that's the only place I know of. Ultraviolet radiation is also dangerous, as you know. I just had a piece of my thigh removed because of uh, possible skin cancer. Um, it tans your skin and it might give you skin cancer. As you go down in the spectrum, down in the energy of these um, radiation, it becomes safer and safer until you get to visible light. And then there's a threshold effect. So above ultraviolet, radiation is dangerous, and below ultraviolet, it's not. So I can prove that to you. The lights in this room don't tan you, and they don't give you skin cancer. It doesn't matter how long you stay here. You could stay here 24 hours a day, 364 days a year, you won't get tanned. That's because the, the energy in, in visible light is below a threshold. And that threshold is called ionizing radiation. So that's the stuff you heard about a little bit earlier. So ionizing radiation is dangerous. Non-ionizing radiation is not dangerous in the sense of causing cancer. Now you heard otherwise earlier, and I'll uh, return to that in a minute. I'm just going to present to you the mainstream opinion. The other effect of radiation is thermal, so it heats, and you know this from your microwave ovens. That's how you heat your, your water or your, your breakfast. Um, thermal radiation, or the effects of this, uh, the thermal effects of radiation are regulated by the FCC. And there were a few things um, said that were, I struck me as rather odd about the FCC. I don't think of it as some secret society, you know, out there to, to cause injury to all of us. Uh, it's a regulatory body. They issue guidelines. They don't develop those guidelines themselves. They collect information from other international agencies. And I once read that they studied some something like 1,000 studies to collect their information to, on which to base their um, standards. Um, some of those are, you know, the IEEE, that's the Institute for Electrical uh, and Electronics Engineers, or the National Council on Radiation Protection, and so on. Um, now back to the thermal radiation. The FCC regulations are extremely conservative. So what they do is they look at animal studies, they expose, say, mice or rats to different levels of radiation. This is now non-ionizing radiation. And they determine when the rats behave differently. They could just eat less or sleep more or something like that. And they set that as a threshold for a behavioral difference in these animals. And the FCC set a limit of 50 times lower than that. That's what the standard is right now. That standard is, applies to 4G, it applies to 5G, it applies to everything up to uh, about 100 gigahertz where they just stop regulating. Um, as I mentioned, those standards are extremely conservative. So for instance, the heating pad that I put on my knee this morning, because it was feeling a little arthritic, emits thermal radiation. That's what it does, it warms my knee up. That radiation is about 10 times higher than the FCC standard. That heat pad would not meet FCC regulations. Uh, if you were to go outside, and if the sun, if sorry, if the FCC were to regulate natural sunlight, which is electromagnetic radiation, you would be exposing yourself to radiation 16 times higher than the FCC limit. Now, they don't regulate it because we can see it, and we know, we understand it, we understand how light works. It's like, oh, there's the sun, it's warming me up. There's no need to regulate it. If you feel warm, step into the shade. So the only difference is we can see the light and we can't see the radio waves um, for 4G or 5G. I should stress that electromagnetic radiation is the most well understood phenomenon in the universe. 
It has been essentially perfectly understood since 1865. There is nothing new between 4G and 5G. The only difference is the density of the infrastructure and the frequency at which it operates. Nothing new. By the way, the frequency at which it operates is uh, about a million times lower than that magical threshold of danger of ionizing radiation. Okay. So in my view, there's, there's nothing dangerous about 4G or 5G or microwaves or uh, anything else like that. X-rays, so on, that's a different story. So uh, I want to address, that, that's the physics of this. That's the, I'm speaking to you as a physicist. Um, you heard a perspective from a biological point of view, which is, well, I don't know how this electromagnetic radiation works. Let me just see what it does to rats. And um, one of the examples given was the um, National, National Toxicology Program study on rats, which was a large-scale study. It was carefully done, um, and it found an effect. Um, and you were told that that study tells you that, you that your cell phones are giving you brain, brain cancer. That is incorrect. That is classic cherry picking of data. There are thousands upon thousands of studies. Some of them are going to find an effect. It's a, it's a statistical law of doing studies. Some of them have to be wrong. If you focus your attention on the ones that are wrong and ignore all the ones that are right, then you will have an incorrect opinion. It's just the way it goes. So I don't know if you've run into this, this concept of p-values. Typical studies quote p-values of 5%. What that means is that 5% of the time, they're just wrong. That means that one in 20 studies is wrong. It's telling you incorrect information. It has to by the statistical nature of studies. Unfortunately, the NTP study falls into that category. And I have evidence in favor of that. For example, the mice, or sorry, the rats that were exposed to radiation actually live longer than the rats which were not exposed to radiation. Male rats got glioma brain cancer much more than female rats did. There's no plausible biological explanation for a sexual difference in incidence of brain cancer. There, and the chief problem is that they had limited statistics. And the problem with that is that you can only afford to examine so many rats because doctors have to do it and they cost a lot. Um, and brain cancer is rare. So what that means is that the study is, is susceptible to statistical fluctuations. And in fact, I just completed a few days ago a, a, a statistical analysis of their own data. And I found that yes, indeed, if I look at their data, there is a higher incidence of brain cancer amongst the rats that are exposed to cell phones. However, if I look at all the National Toxicology Program data on rats and brain cancer, Instead of just the one study, they've done about 12 studies. If I examine all of that data, the situation flips over completely and there's actually a curative effect from exposure of rats to cell phone radiation. It actually has, they actually have less brain cancer. Um, so what that NTP study is really telling you is not that you're getting brain cancer from your cell phones, it's telling you that doing studies on rare things is very difficult. That's what it's telling you. Um, there are a few other things I should tell you. Uh, we had a good question from Representative Wheeler. Where are all the lawsuits? They're not there because the science isn't there. Okay, there's no way you can prove something that, that doesn't exist. Um, I could equally well ask, where's all the brain cancer? And actually, you can Google this. You don't have to trust me. You can just find a plot of incidence of brain cancer in the United States over time, and you'll see it's actually gone down since the advent of cell phones, the advent of cell phone technology. So where the lawsuits are is the same place where all the brain cancer is. It doesn't exist. They're not there. So I think I could say more, but I think I'll, uh, I'll stop there and just uh, leave it open for questions. Thank you. So if, if you can follow up if you wanted to on your question, Representative Connor. Um, yeah, doc, uh, Dr. Hart, earlier I asked a question um, concerning uh, the possibility of, I guess, cell phone design or, or equipment design in such a way as to minimize, um, you know, 
I guess, extraneous RF radiation or electromagnetic fields. Um, is, is, has that ever been looked at? It, it, based on something that Dr. Haro had said, it sounded like there, that may have been done in maybe in other countries or something like that. I, I, and I'm, I'm kind of speculating off of, uh, off of something that he said. Yeah, he was implying that moving antennas inside of cell phones was some sort of conspiracy to hide radiation from all of us. I, I think it's more of an aesthetic thing myself. Um, unfortunately, I don't know what the manufacturers do about this. I'm sorry, I can't answer your question. I have a, just an add-on for uh, our, both RFI and EMI, radio frequency interference and electromagnetic interference. Anytime anybody puts any type of network in any of these buildings, uh, you go through these different checks because there's a lot of RFI and EMI running here right downtown. And when you have that, when you find that out, you put in shielded wiring. In other words, there's ways to get around um, the uh, emission effects by shielding those networks. So if we do the same type of concept on both the antennas and if the actual handset needs it, you can put in shielding that is has been going on for decades as far as uh, trying to uh, do a fix on something that's been around for since I've been in the business and before that. You know, RFI and EMI has been around and there's engineering ways to get around it. And Dr. Swenson, I had one follow-up question. Um, in, in discussing the studies, and I, I take your point about you have to look at all the studies, et cetera, and you can always find statistical anomalies. Um, the the reference to the World Health Organization uh, and Dr. Miller, uh, his study concerning the rise in brain cancer rates amongst teenagers, can you give give us an idea of whether or not you found that to be statistically significant or if you were familiar with that study at all? Unfortunately, I don't know his study. I can speculate and I can say something about the World Health Organization. Okay. Um, it sounds, if you take a, a bunch of data and, and say you, you, you know, survey a million people about brain cancer and cell phone use, and you start to slice it different ways, say, you know, white males above 50 or teenagers below 13 or something like that, what you're doing is, is, is making the equivalent of what I mentioned before, where you are asking, where you, you eventually statistically have to find a signal if you continue to slice. And I suspect that that's what has happened there, because there's no real reason for, you know, one group to be more susceptible than, than another. There's no biological reason for that. Um, about the World Health Organization, they, uh, unfortunately, I really regret this, about two years ago issued a statement classifying cell phones as a type 2B carcinogen. Um, type 2B is a rather mild categorization, talcum powders in that, uh, uh, sawdust is there, diesel fuel is in that. Um, that categorization was based on a single data point of a single study. So remember, there are thousands of studies, and they chose to look at a single data point in a single study. That study is called the Interphone Study. It was a large-scale study made in Europe. Um, unfortunately, they could not access, because of European privacy laws, the cell phone user's um, information. They weren't allowed to do that, so they had to uh, uh, ask the users how much they use cell phones. And that single data point was the, the people who self-reported using the cell phone so much that they used it for more than 24 hours a day. So they had to report how many hours they used it a month, and it was more than there are hours in a month. So the, the researchers themselves discounted that data point, but the WHO, actually it was the subcommittee of the World Health Organization, decided not to neglect that data point and on, on the principle of prudence, um, declared it to be a possible carcinogen. Thank, thank you, Doctor. We're gonna, um, Representative Wheeler, do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, you, you already asked and answered the question I had originally, which was, you know, if this was uh, a, a litigation opportunity when it had been taken advantage of already, you right. answered that part of it. Um, on the health side of it, which is something I don't get to study, but I'm glad we're talking about it, uh, the uh, saturation of, of this energy that we're talking about concentrating in residential areas, is that something that we should be at least concerned about? Or is, I, I want to make sure I'm not asking the same questions I've been asked before about 
what are the health consequences, but that's the only thing I can think of that we haven't really covered from what you've already done in your testimony. Thank you. So th there, there are two primary differences with 5G versus 4G. Remember, it's not all perfect division and so on, but let's just speak roughly. Um, the, the devices, the transmitters and receivers themselves are going to be much smaller, like the one that's just outside there. It's about this big. Uh, they operate at much lower power. Um, I've heard as all the equipment's different, so again, I have to estimate, but I've heard estimates between 5 watts and 40 watts. And just for comparison, your cell phone is uh, a few watts and your microwave is 1,000 watts. Um, the big towers operate at much higher. They're several hundred watts. So they're going to be much smaller, much less power, but more densely arranged. The net effect on you is sort of a wash. So if you're underneath, I did this calculation a little while ago, if you're underneath a 4G, what they call a macro tower, um, your exposure is typically about one one thousandth of the FCC limit. And remember, that's another factor of 50 below what is measurable. Um, if you are underneath that tower that's just outside, so standing right underneath it on the pole, it's about the same. Your exposure will be about one one thousandth of the uh, FCC limit. And then the one question I wanted to ask you that I didn't ask earlier had to do with uh, power lines. When I was growing up, there was alarmed news reports about the fact that if you live near high power lines, then you're probably going to have all kinds of health concerns later in life. Yes. Well, my wife picked a house next to some power lines, and so far we're all okay, but is it the same kind of situation where, again, that's, that's in that non-ionizing radiation spectrum that is in the, the, the graph that was presented? Yes. Um, Tell me, is it, what am I dealing with there? Is that the same kind of situation here where it's about the amount of energy that we're talking about? You're exactly right. It's exactly the same situation, except even more extreme. Um, the whole, I teach, actually teach this in my undergraduate class. I call this the power line fiasco. It cost the country something like $20 billion to remediate a non-existent effect. So there were claims, actually our previous expert witness teaches this in his class at McGill, that power lines caused childhood leukemia. These went wild, I lived through the same thing as you did, um, until eventually large-scale studies show that it was completely spurious. For the reasons that I was discussing, the, the frequency and therefore the energy of this radiation is extremely low. It's much lower than the radiation we're talking about in, in radios or in cell phones. So they have no effect whatsoever on the human body. The, the um, power lines. Great. My wife will be glad to hear that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dennis Swanson. So we're going to start wrapping this up. We do have a question by Representative Pappas and then Representative Skelcorn. Thank you. Um, Dr. Swanson, thank you very much for your presentation. And my question is actually on the letter that you were so kind to provide to us. Um, and specifically on the, um, the quotes that you provide from um, worldwide health and safety organizations with respect to um, the impact of um, RF exposures. I'm just noticing that um, the various quotes here refer to different standards. So we're talking in the World Health Organization, we're talking about international standards. In the Health Canada quote, there's a reference to safety a safety code. In the United Kingdom quote, it's guideline in below guideline levels. Um, in the Swedish Council quotes, below current exposure guidelines. And in the Norwegian, it's you know they talk, they talk about weak RF fields. Um, and my question, I guess, is how how do these different standards, are they the same as the FCC standard or are they different? Thank you. Um, I, I actually am not very familiar worldwide, but I have looked at the European standards. So these are adopted in the EU. I guess Britain will no longer have that in a few months. I don't know. Um, and those standards are within a, a few percent of American standards. There's some very slight differences between them. So basically, the world has come to the same conclusion, uh, at least the developed world. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Representative Pappas? No. Representative Skilgren. 
Thank you very much. I've got a brief question and just a, a comment. First, uh, Mr. Carlini, actually former trustee Carlini, uh, thank you for your comments. It's interesting, you, you, you paint on the paint the picture of economic development. As someone who's been uh, part of a site selection, uh, you know, access to high speed data is a, is a big deal. So I, I just hope that you know, other people here are listening to that. And as we continue that access, uh, you know, through wireless or fiber or whatever, I think all the above of, um, is what we need to go for, and uh, especially in this new age digital technology, you've got companies that are doing graphic design and stuff and uploading uh, giant files at speed matters. And if they can do it through fiber and they can do it through wireless, uh, all, the, all the better. So uh, you know, thank you very much. All you have to do is look at places like South Korea. Their infrastructure is way ahead of us. And you look at what they pump out as far as appliances and cars. That used to be a third world country 40, 50 years ago. And now they're a world class competitor. And part of that reason is that they have a state of the art intelligent infrastructure that they can can compete worldwide because they have a world-class network infrastructure, something that we used to have before the breakup of the Bell system in 1984. But since 84, we've gone down, other countries have gone up. That's something to think about. Because we're in, we're in competitive, we have to be very competitive in the world basis, and I think a lot of times we either don't get it or we forget it, but we need to understand that, especially in Illinois. All areas, not just one or two regions, the whole state. Thank you very much. Is there any other members? Actually, uh, Chair, I just want to ask the doctor one more question. Uh, so I was getting at earlier about, let's say there's some 5G nodes outside, and supposedly it's just line of sight. Uh, is that frequency, and is it, was it 2.5 gigahertz? Is that correct? For 5G? Yes. Uh, it varies. It goes up to 30 gigahertz. Okay. So are those frequencies penetrating the, the walls of, say, this room here? Uh, I am not completely sure. Um, if, if the walls are damp, then no. I think if you have dry walls, then yes, they can penetrate, but not too far. So this is one of the reasons they want them close together. Mm, that's true. Thank you so much. Well, there's no further other questions, but I just, I just want to say thank you for your time. Uh, I know we went a little bit over, but I think it's an important uh, topic and um, it just, just reminds me of, you know, just, there's always, I think, with the internet, a lot of information gets out there and we never really know what is exactly the, the best. But, you know, one thing, being a staffer, I always heard my, a um, couple of my former bosses, they say, just, just keep finding the right person and pay the right person until you, you get the right answer that you want to hear. And I think that's, um, that's something that, that, you know, when we, we did uh, certain projects, he just said, just find, a, find an expert that will, will say what we want to hear. But I, I think there's, there's a lot of information out there, and it just reminds me of right now just what's happening to the measles, you know, vaccines. People are saying, you know, I, I just think that all these stuff gets spread around next thing you know, now we got a measles epidemic. So I just, I think... We, it's something new, but radio frequencies haven't been around. Have been around for ages, and I think anything in too much exposure is bad. So, but I hope no one stands or hugs towers all the time. And but I think we should be. I'm sure this is. We'll, we'll bring this topic again, and I thank everyone for your time. I know we went over, but um, thank you very much. The chair, we'll call a recess to the chair. Thank you very much. Which, uh, are you rep which organization would you like to represent? Well, go ahead. Go ahead. And then we'll, we'll finish right after you. Okay. I'll be quick. No problem. Please state your name for the record. Please turn it on. Oh, I thought, sorry, I thought it was on. My name is Kimberly Walker, and I live in Chicago, and I have for 43 years. And I want to talk a little bit to... Um, 
some of what has been said so far today. Um, as far as the FCC, somebody had asked about the FCC. If you go to their website and you go to the homepage, they have four strategies. There is one paragraph that talks about innovation and creati creativity, and they really push it. We want to be innovative with this te technology. We want to be creative. We're going to get it out there. You go to the last strategy, and it says, we are going to do everything we can to deregulate this, because it's innovative and it's creative. There's another paragraph. It takes you the entire paragraph to get to the last three words that say, promote public safety. An entire paragraph on innovation and creativity. An entire paragraph on deregulation. Three words on promote public safety. This is the FCC website. This is their homepage. There are four strategies. You scroll down and you can find that. So there was a question about the FCC. There was a question about um, court cases. There has been a court case. It was in Italy. There was a man and in his occupation he had used a cell phone or he had used a cordless phone for four to six hours a day. He did just win a court case because he had a schwannoma here. And so there are court cases at this point and they are being won. And you need to realize that the telecom industry is not insured. The Lloyds of London and Swiss RE have likened it to asbestos. They are not insured. So when all the medical issues do start to come forward because they are going to start to come forward, who's going to pay for it? Your constituents. We are going to have to pay those medical expenses. Um, as far as education, so the first person was talking about innovation and getting this out into schools. I was a CPS teacher for 16.1 years, and I can tell you in those 16 years, I did not need to use technology. The research is now looking at the fact that students are doing cognitive dis offloading. That means that because everything is so in their face all the time, the information is always there, they have no reason to remember it anymore. We shouldn't be bombarding them with technology in class. We want them to learn and retain the content. And I was a very good teacher who taught my students without having to use technology. I would go to the computer lab once a year to look at the Census Bureau so that they could understand what was happening in their community as far as sal salaries, demographics, stuff like that. It absolutely does not have to be in classrooms. We do not have to have a Wi-Fi router in the classroom and tablets on every single desk, whether students are testing for six hours a day while those tablets or those laptops are on or while they're working in a, a station. They're on and there's three to four antennas on each of those devices. And as far as what the physics professor has said, Dr. Aaron Swanson and Representative Andrade, you, one of your last statements, you have to pay the right person to uh, say the right thing. He is being paid by the CTIA, which is the telecom industry. He is being paid to come up here and say information that looks good for the telecom industry. I would like you to take what he has said with a grain of salt and understand that Dr. Eru, who came here, who was not paid to come here, we paid him nothing. He is an objective, non-biased, independent scientist. He is not funded by anyone to research this. He comes in front of you with research that he has found over a very long, many years doing this research as far as electromagnetic radiation. So when you go back to research this, and I hope you're going to go back and research this, you understand that when you're looking at information, the number one question that you have to look at, who funded this research? Who's behind this? Because that determines whether or not you can take that and really run with that information. I would also like to know his science. We saw the science, we saw the empirical data from Dr. Eru. We did not see any of that from the physics professor. Show me your science that shows definitively that there are no negative health effects. He did not show us any of it. I would also like to talk about the connectivity uh, as far as it being corporate facilities. My children are not corporate. Why is this going in residential areas? He may have a point as far as corporate is concerned, but my children aren't. They draw with chalk on the sidewalk. They ride their bikes up and down the street. Why are there going to be two to three of these cell towers on my block in front? I can control what I do in my house, and I have. We don't have a Wi-Fi router. My children are not allowed to play video games on wireless controllers. They are not allowed. Our cell phones are off. My cell phone is on airplane mode all the time. My family knows. I'm going to check it once at night, and that's it. And if it's an emergency, they have to call the landline. 
I can protect myself inside my house. I cannot protect my children outside on the street if these are on every single corner, at every single block. We have cell towers on top of CPS schools. We have a cell tower on the schools of C where our kids are going. They're there longer than what they are at home, and now when they come home and they play outside, there's gonna be more cell towers? We need a moratorium on this. We need to stop this until there is science that says there are no negative health effects. We can't keep pushing this through when there's so there's hundreds of scientists that have signed an appeal that says you need to stop this. There are hundreds of scientists who have said to the FCC, you need to test this. Do you know how they tested it? They put water with salt in a dummy. They put a cell phone next to it. That homogeneous solution is supposed to represent our brain. I don't know if you've looked at a picture of a brain, but there's no way that represents our brain. We have electrical synapses that are happening in our brain. These are electromagnetic waves. It makes sense that there's a possibility that something is happening there on the biological level. We need to stop this from moving out, from moving out into the entire state of Illinois where there are children that are playing, where we cannot protect them. Thank you, Kimberly. And, and, here, and Kimberly, we could also, um, I know you've called my office. I just, uh, unfortunately, I, I'm very limited right now. I'm um, connected to a machine actually right now. Right. So I just, put, I'm more than willing to sit down and, and meet with you uh, personally. I, I, my health will be better uh, very soon, I hope. Okay. So I, I will more than gladly um, meet you uh, in time. I just, I'm a little homebound right now. So I appreciate please feel free. We um, we have our, our email, send us information, and we'll, we'll bring this topic up again. Uh, and, and just, and, and if you may, for Shop. So the if, you may, if you may finish up, oh. thank you. You said um, you had one point. One other point. Uh, we were told that 25,000 jobs were going to be created, but how many people have to get sick in that process? I realize, I realize we need to work, but at what expense to our health? Billions of dollars in economic growth, but how many billions of dollars in lawsuits? How many billions of dollars in medical expenses? You know, we really need to look at both sides of this. We need to protect the people. We need to protect our safety. And I, I know you said that you haven't copied everything. I have copied everything. And I have a list of what's happening in the US as far as what senators and representatives are doing. And if you would like, it's right there and I can hand it to you. But I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Representative Ajade, I appreciate it. Thank you to Tyler as well for all the questions he answered from. You know, we're here to, uh, to listen and um, that's that's why we went, we went much over than the regular plan, but it's, I know it's important to you and it's it important is. to us, and that's why we took the extra time to make sure we hear everyone out. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you, the S Committee of Cybersecurity, Dan's Committee, uh, recesses the call of the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you.